<laughs> how is an arhat defined in the Vajrayana tradition? Is it different from the definition in the Theravada tradition? Okay. Oh, first of all, I want to talk what you're saying, Vajrayana tradition, because you introduced me as a Vajrayana nun. Okay. <laughs> okay. First, I've got to go. This is a soapbox. Okay. I'm going to get on my soapbox. But this is a big misunderstanding in the West. We tend to divide things into there is Vipassana, and maybe we'll include some Theravada with that. You know, I'm just talking how generally it is. There's Theravada, or there's Vipassana, there's Zen, and there's Vajrayana. And that's how many Westerners think those are the three traditions. Uh-uh. Okay. First of all, Vipassana meditation is found in every Buddhist tradition. Okay. It isn't its own tradition. It's a mode of, it. it's insight and it's, you know, how do you approach the ultimate nature of reality? Okay. And every tradition has that. Okay. So I would say Theravada, or actually I would say the Pali tradition. Bring it back to, to the roots, to the Pali tradition. And then, uh, you know, in the Library of Wisdom and Compassion, we say the Pali tradition and the Sanskrit tradition, okay? And then, uh, you know, Zen, is because in the West, is, you know, okay, Vipassana, Zen, Theravada, like there's three, what? Vajrayana. And they're completely... Uh, distinct traditions, okay? From the perspective of Tibetan Buddhism, we practice all three, okay? We're Mahayana practitioners. Vajrayana is a branch of Mahayana. Chan or Zen is a branch of Mahayana. Pure Land is a branch of Mahayana. Huayan is a branch of Mahayana. There's many branches of Mahayana. Vajrayana is not something that is different from Mahayana. And Mahayana is practiced on the basis of the Theravada teachings. Yeah, what is taught in, in, in the Theravada is fundamental to practicing Mahayana and fundamental to practicing Vajrayana. And this is not understood very well in the West. Okay. So I never say I'm a Vajrayana nun. Okay. In, in my practice, I have some little bit of Vajrayana meditation, but basically my practice revolves around the three higher trainings. Yeah. The four truths and uh, the six uh, perfections, yeah, and a little bit of Vajrayana, okay? So it's, it's, you know, and whatever Vajrayana I do includes, you. if you sit down to do a Vajrayana uh, practice, you start with refuge, you take refuge in the three jewels. Then you generate bodhicitta. Then you do the four immeasurables, okay? There's a time in the sadhana where you, uh, you, do, you do vipassana meditation. You meditate on emptiness, on selflessness, yeah? So all these kinds of teachings that you've had before are all found in the Vajrayana. You know, you, de you can develop, uh, you know, shamatha in the Vajrayana tradition. So all those teachings are found there. You know, Vajrayana is not some separate, you know, thing. Yeah, and then, oh my goodness, there's so much other confusion about Vajrayana in the West, you know. Oh, those people, they all drink and have sex. Give me a break. Okay, give me a break. That's not what my teachers taught me. No, you've got to be based on sila, for goodness sakes. Now, some people have their own interpretation of Vajrayana, and some teachers have their own way of doing it. You know, that's their business. 
the way I was taught was, you know, what I'm describing to you. Okay. And this is part of the reason why so many people, uh, they think, oh, well, Vajrayana isn't even Buddhism. Look at what these people are doing, you know. So it's, um, yeah. And also some people do misbehave. Yeah. But some people misbehave in every single Buddhist tradition too. It's not just Vajrayana. It's, it's human beings. It's ignorance, isn't it? Yeah. Um, now, what was the original question? <laughs> our our hearts defined. Okay. So sure. I, I remember when we were at the uh, monastic conference at Spirit Rock together, you know, and that subject came up and, oh, it was definitely fiery. Okay. So I think um, pretty much, you know, in many ways, how the Mahayana sees our hearts uh, is very, very similar. But we do make a difference between our hearts and Buddhas. And in our prayers, we do call Buddha an our heart. Yeah, so the term our heart applies to the Buddha. Yeah. Um, but there is some differences in them. Yeah, according to how we look at it. So Avadri, um, the way we talk about it is there's two sets of obscurations on the mind. There's the afflictive obscurations and the cognitive obscurations. The afflictive obscurations are, are the afflictions, the fetters, the underlying tendencies, all of those, okay? What's considered in, in you know, in, it's common in the Theravada and uh, Mahayana, you know. So all the, the afflictions um, that are based on ignorance, which is the, the root of the whole thing, okay? So an arhat has eliminated all of those afflictions, all of the fetters, the underlying um, tendencies, all of those things, they're all eliminated, okay? And so an arhat is free of samsara. They are never again reborn in samsara. Okay. So the Buddha, that what I just said, also holds true as the Buddha, for the Buddha. But we say that the Buddha, in addition, has eliminated this other set of more subtle defilements called the cognitive defilements. And those are the latencies of the afflictions and the fetters and, you know, all the other defilements, the latencies that cause a subtle, what we call a subtle dualistic appearance in the mind. And that dualistic appearance uh, prevents the mind from becoming omniscient. Yeah. So, uh, we say that the Buddha has eliminated also those subtle afflictions so that the Buddha is completely omniscient. Now, usually in Theravada, you say the Buddha is all-knowing and distinguish and say the Buddha is all-knowing, but he's not omniscient, okay? At least the, my Theravada friends have said this this way. So by all-knowing, it means that if the Buddha turns his mind to some topic, then he can know it. But he doesn't perceive everything all at one time simultaneously. When in the Mahayana, when we say the Buddha is omniscient, we say at, the, at one time he can perceive all phenomena simultaneously. Okay, so it's a little bit different talking about the capabilities of the Buddha. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, next question on the list. Um, this one says, is learning how to live together with others essential to awakening? I think so. Because if you want to awaken, you know, what is your, I'm talking from my Mahayana perspective, what is your reason for awakening. You want to be of the greatest benefit to all living beings. 
Yeah, you want to share the teachings and help living beings. So if you want to help living beings, you've got to gain all the realizations. If you want to help living beings most effectively, you need to gain all the realizations. Of course, we can all help living beings. Even right now, we can do something. But we need to gain those realizations. Now, if you want to help living beings, you need to know something about them. How are you going to learn about living beings? Yeah, by being with them. <laughs> yeah. And especially, you know, when we see that one of the most amazing skills, I think, of the Buddha is how he was able to deal with so many different kinds of people. You know, when you read the Pali Suttas and you know, here the Buddha is, and he's talking to Jains, and he's talking to, to the uh, hedonists, and he's talking to the Brahmins, and he's talking to the beggars. And he's, you know, he can relate to everybody. Yeah. And that is a special quality that enables him to be of great benefit. Well, how did he gain that, that quality? You know? Part was through meditation and probably samadhi, but part was from living with them. And when you live with others, boy, you see the differences in temperament, in interest, in disposition. Yeah. And you really feel that, that difference. And you begin to realize how, how open-minded and flexible you need to be in order to be of benefit to others. That we can't come in with, I know what's best and it's all in this one box. And you got to do it like exactly like that. Yeah. And what I said to you, I say to every single person because they're all exactly the same. No. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same like if you're a school teacher. Yeah. If you're, I mean, you're even teaching kindergarten. Do you, te do you say the same thing to every kindergarten kid? No. You know, a kid that misses their mom and dad on the first way of, day of school, you're going to talk to one way. A kid who um, is a little bit obstinate, you're going to talk to another way. A kid who likes to draw, you're going to, you know, encourage that. A kid who likes to sing, you encourage that. I mean, just even as a regular teacher, to, to educate people and, and to help children, you need to understand the differences uh, and be able to speak to the differences. So clearly, uh, you know, to, to do that. In our practice, we need to be aware. And living with other people, boy, it, you know, we at the Abbey here, Shravasti Abbey, we say it's like uh, rocks in a tumbler, okay? And the rocks in the tumbler get thrown around. And what we do is we chip off each other's uh, rough edges and we polish each other, yeah? And when, if you live alone, you miss that benefit. Yeah. If you want to be a solitary monastic, you miss all that benefit of having, <laughs> of having your self-centered, egotistical mind confronted in real time. Yeah. And you can get very complacent and you... You know, make your own little, um, you make the schedule that conforms with what you like. Yeah, you do the practices, your meditation sessions are as long as you want them. Uh, you can make whatever food you want like that. And um, there's, there's something, a way that you have to grow when you live in community that uh, is quite special. And I've lived in community and I've also lived by myself. I've had the experience of both. So that's what I'm talking from. Yeah.
Wonderful, thank you. Uh, here's another question. This one says, how can one cultivate compassion? Is it necessary to do compassionate activities or is meditation alone sufficient? We start with meditation and then we've got to be able to act it out too. Okay. Um, but some people go to acting compassion before they've cultivated compassion. And to, to actually be compassionate, we need a very strong Dharma practice. Because when you're compassionate, you know, and you try and do things that are helpful to people, it's not like everybody says, oh, fantastic, you're so wonderful, thank you for your help. Some people go, huh, what are you talking about? Go away, I don't know, I don't want to hear what you have to say. You know, who do you think you are? Or you spend time and you give advice and, and then they go to the opposite. So if you don't have a strong uh, inner practice of compassion, you are gonna get discouraged and you're gonna get burnt out, okay? So when they call, talk about uh, compassion burnout, it's pointing, it's telling us that our compassion needs more development. It's not that we've run out of compassion. It's we need to develop more compassion, <laughs> okay? So it starts, uh, I think it has to start uh, you know, as the Buddha talked about, you know, hearing or learning, yeah, reflecting and thinking about compassion, meditating on compassion. We have to go through all those three and then, you know, doing compassionate actions. Doing compassionate actions doesn't mean that, you know, we are now the latest, you know, um, Mr. or Ms. Fix-It of everybody's problems. Yeah, and we don't have to go around being, uh, I say, Susie cream cheese, okay? You know, the, um, it's a, somehow, I don't know, I learned that expression <laughs> when I was a kid. The perfect person who's always nice, who's always kind, who always reaches out and makes you feel good. You know, that's not who we have to be, okay? Yeah, being compassionate requires so much inner strength. Oh my goodness, you know, you have to have so much inner strength to be compassionate. Um, so you have to, you know, have your practice, hearing, thinking, meditating, and then you have to have a sensitivity as to what compassion means, yeah? It doesn't mean everybody has to go set up a homeless shelter. Sometimes being compassionate is just looking at somebody and saying, thank you for what you did. I really appreciate it. Yeah. There's, there's no, uh, you, you have to see what the, what people require, what is needed in the situation. And and some and people show their compassion in so many different ways. And we need all the different ways. Yeah. If all everybody did was, you know, do socially engaged things, then what about the individual compassion, you know, to people who are right in front of your nose? You know, if everybody just dealt with the people in front of their nose, oh, what about? the, you know, the things we need for societal change. So I think we need all the different ways that people can, can express compassion, you know? And everybody's gonna have their own way according to their personality, you know, their disposition. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And uh, next we have a question here. Uh, when living in community, different monastics may have different vocations. Some might be more inclined towards study. Some like to work or do ceremonies or counsel mm -hmm. people and so on. How do you facilitate harmony between them? You rejoice. Yeah. 
you rejoice at what everybody else in the monastery does. Yeah, because you're all there together for the common purpose of progressing towards awakening, for the common purpose of benefiting, you know, society. So you rejoice at all the different people, all the different things that people do to actualize those, those common um, motivations that you have. Yeah. And yes, some people love ceremonies. Some people can't stand them. Yeah. Some people like a lot of ceremonies. Some people like a little ceremonies. You know, you just kind of, you know, if your monastery does ceremonies, you join in. Yeah. But then some people want to do more ceremonies. That's fantastic. Okay. We have people who do ceremonies online and in, and have other people join in the ceremonies. They all do. I mean, we have a medicine Buddha practice. We have people in Ukraine and Russia doing the medicine Buddha practice with us. That's fantastic. Okay. Now, that is led by a few people, not the whole monastery. And other people in the monastery, at the time they're on Zoom, leading medicine Buddha practice with the people all over the world. Yeah. Then other people are sitting and studying philosophy. And other people may be doing, you know, an extra meditation session. And then you just rejoice at, at all the different ways that people practice. Yeah. Because everybody's creating merit. Everybody's doing something worthwhile. You don't all have to do everything exactly the same. Yeah. You know, if you live in a monastery, yes, there's meditation sessions. Everybody goes. There's certain rituals. Everybody participates. Yeah. But then there's so much space within the structure to do other things. And, and you know, there's teachings. Everybody attends. Some people like to discuss the teachings afterwards for many hours and have a review session. Other people would rather go back and just, you know, go over their notes. Some people want to meditate. Some people want to do a ceremony that's like, I've had enough philosophy for today, you know? So you rejoice at what everybody's doing. Wonderful. And we're, we're running out of time. So maybe we could have one last question. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let me see. There's still several on the list. So I, I need to pick one of these. Um, okay. So this one, uh, sometimes when people come to Buddhism, uh, they, and they hear about liberation, they think of it as freedom from things like injustice like social injustice, mm -hmm. rather than greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? I agree that people think like that. And it involves a process of educating them uh, on what the Buddha meant by the word freedom. Yeah. It's an education process, you know. And education things. People come to Buddhism with all sorts of ideas. Yeah. So it's always a process of education. Okay. Uh, and I think maybe we can go ahead and, and end it this time. Uh, so uh, deep appreciation to Venerable Tupton children for taking time to share the Dhamma with us. Uh, so with the all the monastics who sent in questions to ask as well as to all the people who are watching and participating uh, again we we appreciate you sharing your practice and and the dhamma with all of us uh, so um uh, traditionally we end with three sadhus uh unless there's another ending chant that you would like to do we'd be happy to do whatever is customary for you if you wish okay i'll i'll do that chant Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate 
all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May the born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Wonderful. So now we'll end the session with three sadhus. Mm -hmm. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. And we'll see you all next time. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. And very nice seeing you, Monte. Yeah. Thank you for joining.